Hi, my name is Jonna Ireland. I'm an artist and the author of the new photography book regarding Paul R. Williams, and you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Architect Walter Gropius, among a very few others, is credited with bringing modernism to the U.S. back in the 1930s, and he's still very much admired 51 years later, since his death in 1969. With us today is his granddaughter, Erica Fometer, and later some of the world's only music that mentions Gropius, by the champion of the clever, Tom Lehrer. This young man of 92 just put his entire canon of hilarious songs into the public domain, and you can listen to all of it at www.tomlehrersongs.com. And now, your host, who, as our own theme song proves, clearly can't carry a tune and has been heard singing on FM radio only once, George Smart. Hi, folks. That's so true. I do have a very limited singing range, about an octave. Well, maybe an octave. So did Bob Dylan. <laughs> maybe an octave and a half, and mm-hmm. always the low notes. <laughs> the, the peak of my career came during a WRDU radio call in, Tom's old station. Oh. When you had to sing the Star Spangled Banner oh, for, for some a... cheesy prize. Really? I was the first call, and I, I, was, I was doing great right up until the high note of Land of the Free, well, but they gave me the prize anyway. That is a notoriously hard to s- song. It's like. Eight octaves or something that yeah. you have to. That's why we yeah, picked I was, it, probably. I was seven octaves short. Do you remember what you won? Um, I, it was tickets to something. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Sounds about right. Thankfully, that was pre-internet, so there's absolutely no record of this unique and compelling performance that anywhere you know of it, of. That, I, that I know of, yes. <laughs> Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. In our continuing world of make-believe, modernist realtor Angela Roll was raised on a secluded modernist island in the Amazon, populated only by immortal warrior women with impeccable architectural taste. When architect Le Corbusier crashes his plane into this paradise, Princess Diana is too busy teaching a soul cycle class, and she sends Angela to deal with him. Le Corbusier, after ranting in French about how Americans have no style, encourages Angela to leave the all-female sanctuary to enter the cynical world of gabled roofs and men for the first time. Ever since, on a mission to defend modernism, Angela deals with unreasonable sellers, unrealistic buyers, incompetent builders, and bureaucratic city councils, while hoping to unlock the potential superpower of modernism the world has yet to fully appreciate. Modernist realtor Angela Roll is your superheroine. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L, or call her 919-995-0550. Thanks, Tom. Walter Gropius founded the heralded Bauhaus in Weimar, Germany, one of the most influential architecture and design schools of the 20th century. Really, ever. Students at this exceptional academy not only studied architecture, but also photography, furniture, art, music, just about everything. The rise of Hitler in the 1930s drove Gropius out of Germany, first to London, working for Maxwell Fry, and later in 1937 to Cambridge, where he taught at Harvard and MIT. Working with former student Marcel Breuer, their American post-war houses were a distinctive combination of box shapes, a technique they developed back in Europe. Gropius and Breuer eventually parted ways, and in 1945, Gropius founded the Architects Collaborative, which would become one of the most well-known and respected design firms in the world. Along with Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, and Marcel Breuer, Gropius was one of the most influential modern architects of the 20th century. He died in 1969. Erica Fometer is a musician, music teacher, and former minister of music who grew up as the granddaughter of Walter Gropius, the daughter of another architect, Charles Forberg, and the stepdaughter of another architect, John Johansson. Wow. 
In 19... My mother had a type. <laughs> <laughs> In 1970, when she was just 10 years old, she went to a crazy metal-themed party honoring Gropius, which was described as the press that she was like a small Teutonic goddess of light with a diadem of bright flowers. Oh. How nice. Really? I don't what, remember that. What's a diadem? <laughs> it's um, like a bouquet? A crown. Yeah, oh, a, crown. a crown. She lives on Cape Cod with her husband and two entitled cats. Welcome, Erica. Thank you. Nice to be here. So, do you remember this party? I think it was called Grope Fest, a memorial celebration called, for your grandfather. That's right. It was called Grope Fest, not a name that we could get away with today. Yes. But at the time, he was nicknamed by his students Grope, so it was a Grope Fest. So he was cool with that. He was totally cool with that. But at, at that point, I mean, there had been parties in his birthday honor before he died, but he died in 69. This was sort of a celebration of his life party. And yes, there were, everyone had to come in a costume and preferably with a headdress of some kind. And having lucky as I was to have very artistic parents, they took care of mine for me, which I vaguely remember as being uncomfortable. <laughs> But uh, you have to that and being beauty. able to sip champagne are my most vivid memories of that party. Oh. Yes, back in the day when we allowed children to misbehave <laughs> and drink exactly champagne. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. I in, didn't get much, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I have in front of me the article from the Boston Sunday Globe, uh, mm. May 24th, 1970. This was a metal party. Decorations exactly. and costumes of sparkling metal. Set brilliant motif for Walter Gropius Memorial Party. The famed architect wanted it full of laughter and gaiety. Solemn orations and sad faces were banned, and guests at the party made it memorable and lively. That sounds like a great gig to go to, particularly when you're 10. <laughs> well, there was a long history at the Bauhaus of having parties, themed parties, because one of the things I personally find so impressive about my grandfather, quite aside from his obvious talents that many people appreciate and see, his personal gifts of being able to draw people out, work with all sorts of different personalities and characters, and especially to tolerate tension. So many of us spend most of our lives, myself included, avoiding conflict. Mm -hmm. Very few people are comfortable with conflict and with arguments. And not that my grandfather participated in them, but he was comfortable with there being strife at the school, which of course there was, because the faculty was one amazing prima donna after another, yeah. you know, and these big, big names that came and were invited to teach there, and they had strong ideas about what they wanted to do and how they saw the future of the school and how they saw the future of their curriculum, and those often clashed, and somebody would storm into Gropius' office and say, that's absolutely it, I cannot work with Schlemmer one more day, <laughs> and storm back out, and then Schlemmer would come storming in the other room and says, I'm so done with Kandinsky, never again, you know, and what my grandfather apparently would often say is, let's have a party. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> and especially a themed party. So it wasn't just about getting together and drinking and dancing, but you had to do something. You had to make something creative to attend the party. And suddenly, magically, a lot of the tensions evaporate, right? Because everyone would run back to their studio or workshop and try to create something wonderful. And then everyone got together and people were applauding and laughing and, and the children were drinking what the champagne. <laughs> Exactly, right. And the whole thing sort of smoothed over. And he had a phrase, a little story that he would tell when somebody asked him once about how did you manage that? How did you manage all these big egos and all the conflict? And, and of course, I mean, there was tremendous conflict with the cities that they were in and financing. And I mean, it was just one long struggle, a very productive struggle, but there was hardly an easy year in there. And he told this little story about his teachers and, and getting them to get along. He said, when the fisherman goes out and fishes and he's many days out at sea, on the way back, he puts a little shark in the tank to keep the fish fresh. Uh -hmm. And that was his way of saying, you know, it's, it's good. It keeps things lively and, you know, fresh. 
if everyone has a little tension and a little strife to kind of motivate them. Well, it doesn't suppress ideas, that's for sure. It, exactly. It brings out all sorts of things. And he had a great sense of humor, too. I understand he used to call your grandmother the majority? Yes, exactly. He did have a lovely, dry, and quiet sense of humor, and just like with little names like that. And so, yeah, in, in German, die Majorität. And so if anybody asked anything in the house, like we came for holidays or something and said, well, you know, what should we have for dinner or for Christmas? Do you want, like, steak or lobster? What would you like, Großpapa? And he'd say, and, and wir fragen die Majorität. We'll, we'll ask the majority. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just very softly. I mean, he was a very gentle person and very self-effacing and yet had this strength of personality to impress people with exactly that and with his curiosity about them and his interest in them. That's what I remember. He's really a lovely human being. That's the person that I knew and only later, of course, as an adult, got to know his work. We spoke a couple of months ago with Elizabeth Garber, whose father was Woody Garber in Cincinnati, and she told of these angelic kind of journeys that she went on with her dad when she was seven or eight years old, exploring architecture. Did you ever have any of those moments with your grandfather? No, not so much going and exploring places, more with my grandmother after he died when I accompanied her on a number of trips. But we rarely talked about architecture in the house. He was not one at all to self-promote or to dwell on his work or his projects. I mean, what I remember mostly is him asking me and my sister questions. What were we doing and what were we making and what were our dolls playing at, you know? And he was tremendously interested in young people and what they had to bring to the table and what their ideas were. So really, there was very little work talk, and there was never, you know, come on, let's go on a tour now of architectural masterpieces in New England. I mean, that was, no, that was sort of work, and work stayed at work. But of course, the house, the beautiful house, was just steeped in their ideology and their vision and their approach to life was evident in every corner. So it it got in through osmosis. We'll talk about that house in just a minute, but I wanted to ask you, you had a special name for your grandfather. Yes, I did. Well, probably if it had just been straight German, it would have been Opa. Opa and Oma, you know, Grandpa and Granny. Yeah. And then my mother called my grandmother, I think she started in her teenage years with a little wink. She started to call her Mama, which of course is French. And sort of a little, I think it was a little bit of a tease, but it sort of stuck. And from that, we, the grandchildren, started to call them Grossmama und Grosspapa, Grandmama and Grandpapa, which is a bit more formal than it probably would have been. But it was, it all extended from that original nickname. And I, as a little girl, I couldn't say that German guttural R in Gross. So it was Gosspapa and Gossmama, which they took with very good humor. Now, did you have any clue he was a, a big deal as a child, or did that come to your consciousness later on? I think it was, there was a party for him at Harvard, a birthday party for his 85th birthday, the year before he died. And I, there are pictures of me standing with him at this party, and there were an awful lot of people there and speeches and so on. I remember that as being like, wow, what is going on? And I also remember when he died, my mother, I knew, of course, he was very sick, and I was living with friends so that she could take care of him. And then when she came to pick me up, she brought the New York Times and just showed me the front page, and it said, you know, Walter Gropius dead at 86 or something. And that also really struck me that, oh, my God, he's in the newspaper. In the know? paper of record. <laughs> exactly. I mean, this isn't even like the <laughs> Wellfleet Times on Cape Cod or something. Right. Tell me about your mother. Ha, ha, ha. Besides having great taste in, you know, architect husbands. Yes, her type. Well, she was, a, you know, she was a powerhouse, and I come from a line of them, but I'm not one. I'm not one, but no, she was a very talented artist, and 
very strong. I mean, she was raised in this, and she felt herself to be inadequate to kind of carry on the family tradition. But actually, she did a beautiful job teaching and giving lectures and, you know, really picking up the torch after my grandmother died and carrying it forward. And if she was difficult to live with, you know, that's that's immaterial. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she lived in England for a while, right? Yes, they moved to England for a couple of years hoping to make a go of it there, but it just didn't pan out. And then Harvard invited him to come and take over the Graduate School of Design. And that was just the beginning of this, you know, huge metamorphosis of design in the United States. Right. Well, of course, it was it was fomenting here as well, but certainly him coming and having students who then brought that out into the world. And of course, as you mentioned in your intro, TAC, I mean, all of that. Now, architect John Johansson was one of the celebrated Harvard Five eventually, and he studied at Harvard under yep. Breuer and Walter Gropius. How did right. he meet your mom? Well, apparently he first met her at a party, again, at my grandfather's house and grandmother's house. Was there a theme? I don't remember <laughs> that part. <laughs> I think it was just, I know that every year they had a gathering at their house to celebrate their graduate students because there weren't that many, you know, and I think the ones that were moving on and getting their degrees or something, and they were all invited out to Lincoln and given a good dinner and a party. And John was about 10 years older than my mother, Mm -hmm. and so he would have been about 25, and he remembers this rather sullen (laughs) 15-year-old who sort of skulked around (laughs) the edges of the party, you know, being forced to serve hors d'oeuvres or something like that, grumpy and scowling. And it was not exactly love at first sight at that point, but then many years later, they met again in New York through mutual friends, and she doesn't remember him. He remembers her. (laughs) Hmm. We've just become familiar with Johansson's work over the last couple of years and have almost all his houses on our website at U.S. Modernist. He was really an extraordinary architect. He really was. He really was. I mean, he was just, had so much innate creativity. And he was just, yeah, I've never known, I've been extraordinarily lucky in my life to have known these people. I mean, when he wasn't, I mean, you couldn't contain it. You couldn't contain it. Even when he had retired from his office, he would write mad limericks and draw and paint crazy pictures. Oh, he told the best limerick about himself and his whole, which I will quote to you in a moment, if I may, for your own fun and amusement. But he built a house for himself. He built, obviously, many, many, many things. But he built a house where we helped him. We all, the three of us and a couple of kids, got together and built this wacky house in upstate New York on some leaning steel pylons. It ended up looking, you may have seen it, like a pyramid with a truncated top. Yes, yes. And the walls were corrugated uh, fiberglass. So it, it was translucent. So oh, if a bird my. flew by, you would see it through the wall of the building. And all the in the original house, all the levels were open. There were no walls on the second floor bedroom or my bedroom, the third floor bedroom. They were just open. So if you wandered at night, you were done for. <laughs> you stayed in bed. In upstate New York? In upstate New York, so near Millbrook, in a little I'm, town called Stanfordville. Okay. I'm thinking this might be a summer house, not very insulated. <laughs> Not terribly insulated, and of course, because it was all open, the heat would come out on the main floor uh-huh. and go straight up to the top of the pyramid while we were our teeth were chattering on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Practical, not so much, but it had a grotto in it, gentlemen. Oh, wow. He designed a bathtub for four or five people in a stone grotto. Like Hefner. And literally, people would come over for dinner, guests would come over, and they would be told to disrobe and get into the grotto and enjoy a hot bath together before dinner was served. Oh, the 70s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> right. This was the first iteration of that house. And in that iteration, there were big sliders. There were no windows per se, but every level in every room had massive sliding glass doors, which in the original house were set into the walls of the house, so therefore at an angle, about a, I don't know, 10 or 15 degree angle, which is not how they're designed to be used. Hmm. So when it rained, 
it oh. would pour buckets mm. inside the house. And we would construct from my window up and way, way up on the third floor, a chute of black garbage bags, contractor bags, <laughs> duct taped together, a chute winding down the spiral staircase and into the grotto to direct the rainwater out of the house and out right. of the living room. And about this, John wrote this most, meanwhile, my mother is railing to the gods above, you know, in a panic. And I think it's kind of fun because I'm like 12, you know. Mm-hmm. And John is, is benign and at peace. And he writes a limerick that says, an architect free of self-doubt built a house made of plastic and grout. It's raining, said daughter, me. We're taking on water. Yes, he said, but think of all I keep out. (laughs) Isn't that lovely? (laughs) The glass is half full. Right, right. Exactly. So that was John, was, you know, full of wonderful vision. And usually there was a good engineer nearby to make sure that things actually opened and closed and shut and didn't leak. Now, according to my notes, that house had a fire at some point and was rebuilt. Yes, exactly. And then it burned to the ground in about 10 minutes. Okay. So, (laughs) and then it was rebuilt and in a slightly modified form with little dormers that came out so the sliders could now be vertical and no longer leaked. And the fiberglass siding was no longer the beautiful pure white that they both loved, but the actually the fire retardant mm. sort of off white, which John fondly called dog's tooth yellow. <laughs> <laughs> is the house still around? It is. It is. They sold it some years before they died when they moved to out to the Cape full time and sold it to a pair of professors from Pratt, I believe. I never met them, but... Um, both architecture professors, I believe. Well, that's the kind of people you want moving into that kind of crazy house. Yep. Exactly. I think they were the high bidders and the only bidders. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if they have an engineer in their Rolodex, too. To exactly help them maintain right. the place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. John Johansson, he lived a long time. He did. He made it to 96. Holy cow. Yep. And your mom lived a long time, too. Pretty well, yeah, 88. Yeah. They passed away roughly around the same time? Yes, within a couple of years. Within John couple died years. in 2012 and my mom in 2014. Okay. Yeah, I see on the internet various photos of her, I think, at different houses and out in Cape Cod. Um, yes. Showing things. Really cool photos. Yeah. Tell us about your father, Charles Forberg. He was an architect, too. How did he, he fit into all this? He was an architect, too. And they met each other at Black Mountain College, which they both attended. In North Carolina, right, yeah. Exactly. And it's just on an aside, it's sort of funny how my mother got there because obviously they had moved many times and finally ended up in Lincoln, and she attended uh, Concord Academy, which nowadays is a wonderfully progressive and creative and liberal educational institution. But at the time, back in the, you know, late 30s and 40s was what it sounded like, Concord Academy. I'm not quite sure they had uniforms, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did. And it was not exactly the educational environment they envisioned for her or she envisioned for herself, but that's that's what was available nearby. And it was a good education. And then in the summer of her junior year in high school, the, the Gropiuses had very good friends who were on the faculty at Black Mountain. You know, I mean, old friends from Germany and, mm-hmm. of course, the primary one being Josef Albers and his wife, Annie Albers. And so she went down to North Carolina to Black Mountain to spend the summer down there, living with the Alberses and working, you know, in the fields and just having an experience and loved it so much. She literally refused to come back and tested out of her senior year and went to college a year early because she loved it so much and felt so at home with those people and with that ideology and that philosophy. And my father came through a very different route, but he was also there, and that's where they met and then got married. And he was an architect and then studied with my grandfather at Harvard, got his master's there, and then he taught at the Institute of Design out in Chicago for some years, which is sort of a little mini 
Bauhaus offshoot as well for as long sure. as it lasted. And uh, Laszlo Maholy Naj, I think, was part of that. Exactly right, and made a lot of good friends and met a lot of people in that circle out there. And he designed mostly houses, but also worked with a lot of artists and did installations like at the Louvre and places like that. But sort of the thing that I trot out as his claim to fame is that he and his partner were really the principal designers of the Pan Am logo. They mm. did a big renovation for Pan Am. And so that classic logo of the blue globe with right. the geodetic lines on it and that typeface with the wings. That, that, was, yeah, that was your was grandfather. Mostly him. Yeah. Now, did he also design the Pan Am building? No, but boy, did I have a heady couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> In the <laughs> mid-70s, when my grandfather designed that building, and at the top of it was my father's logo. Oh, oh okay, wow. yeah. And I would walk down Fifth Avenue and say to myself, That's i got to do something pretty big. And I... <laughs> <laughs> These clown shoes that I'm wearing are very hard to fill. <laughs> right. Your grandfather was really so widely admired that he took on patrons, such as Helen Starro, who helped yes. fund his own house, the Gropius House in Lincoln, Mass., you talked about earlier. So tell us that story. Well, yes. You know, obviously I didn't meet her. And what I've heard about her is just that she was, in her own way, quite a remarkable woman. And she developed at least an appreciation for, if not wholeheartedly in, for modern architecture. But apparently she also felt strongly, what I've heard, is that immigrants coming over because of the situation in Europe really deserved to have a start here in America. And someone, I don't know who I'm afraid, but we could all find out if we researched it, put the two of them in touch, and she volunteered to buy this piece of land in Lincoln, or perhaps she already owned it, and to finance the construction of the house, and then basically sort of lease it to the Gropiuses or mortgage it to them so that they could buy it over time, which they did. But without her, they would have been living in an apartment in Dorchester you know, because mm. they had nothing when they came over. And your mom, I understand, wanted to have a house with no roof. Yes. <laughs> she made a number of requests, most of which she got. Not quite the last one yet. She wanted sand on the floor and a room with no roof. So I don't know if you've seen enough pictures of the house, but her bedroom upstairs leads out onto a deck, a second-story deck. And, of course, above the deck are these beautiful vertical slats for an ivy or some vine to grow on, but of course it has no ceiling. And so that was as close as he could get for that. And the sand, my grandmother nixed that. <laughs> yeah, that would have worked really well in Southern California, maybe. Exactly. Right. Your, your Not mother so wanted much to, in New England, yeah. yeah. Your mother wanted to sleep under the stars. She did. And, yep. and she expressed the desire, which was uh, really listened to evidently during those decades, of wanting to get in and out of the house by herself without having to go past the grown-ups. Exactly. Well, she was, as you might remember from John's story of meeting this sullen teenager skulking mm. around, <laughs> she already knew that there were going to be people coming all the time, all the time, all the time. Students and guests and people driving by who saw the house and, oh, what is this? Ding dong. Where did your Where does this come from? And so on. She wanted desperately. She was shy. She was uncomfortable. She had just moved to America. She just wanted desperately to be able to slink in and out and not have to walk through the living room and greet people and engage in small talk and so on. So off of that same deck on the second story is a spiral staircase that goes down to the ground in the garden. And that was her escape route. And she loved it. And I loved it too when I was there. And I did exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> to the bat cave. Yes. Exactly. Right. Slip out and uh, sight unseen. Now, that house is part of a little cluster of other houses, right? Yes. Well, Breuer, local Breuer, mm -hmm. built his own house down just at the bottom of the hill. And that is privately owned now and is not open to the public, but um, you can certainly see it from the outside. And there was a, a woman I wish I could have met in history. Her name was Catherine Morrow Ford, and she owned one of the houses in this neighborhood and went on to write some of the most seminal books of that time. 
1940, she wrote The Modern House in America. And oh, then in 1951, she wrote The American House Today. In 1954, she wrote Quality Budget Houses. Um, oh. And um, unfortunately, What's her she. Name again? Catherine Morrow Ford. Oh, you can still get these books up. on Amazon, and we have some references to them also at, at usmodernist.org. But we okay. also have a great photo of her. She would travel around the country uh, talking with architecture faculty and with very well-known architects trying to get materials for her book and getting sample houses uh, really ahead of her time. I digress yeah. a little bit here, but she's one of my favorite people to talk about when we get to Lincoln. Yes. I'm sort of stunned that I, oh God, I hope I haven't forgotten, but I don't feel like I've heard of her before. But that's a gross oversight, it sounds like. Now, speaking of Lincoln, you recently hosted the president of Germany, which I was surprised to hear was not <laughs> Angela Merkel, because I wasn't I paying in world <laughs> culture class. She's the chancellor of Germany. Oh, right. So who is the president of Germany, and how did this visit come about? Exactly right. And when they called me, they being historic New England that owns my grandparents' house now, and said, you know, please, please come to this event. The president of Germany is coming, and it would be so great if you could be here and, and give a tour. And I about fell off the couch. I said, Angela Merkel. And I said, oh, no, no, not Angela Merkel. <laughs> I said, well, thank God, because I did actually see Angela Merkel at another event last year for the Bauhaus. But the president of Germany, as I understand it, is a mostly ceremonial position. And the person who holds it for a period of time, I don't re remember how long that is, is elected by the government and by a small, by a group of about 700 people, partly government officials, partly regular people from the public. Again, I'm a little bit vague on it. it was last year when I met him, but it's and it's his job. So Angela Merkel doesn't have to go and smash champagne bottles on every single ship and cut the ribbon to every single museum. This is what this person does, the president, and goes to funerals, international funerals, and that sort of thing. So they're treated with tremendous respect and the full Secret Service accompaniment and all of that, but they have nothing to do with policy or government per se. But a very charming gentleman, Steinmeier, Herr Steinmeier, and his wife, who both spoke perfect English, and I was shaking like a leaf, but they were utterly charming, and I gave them a little impromptu personal tour of the house and explained how I used to dip my finger in the clean toilet water and draw on the bathroom floor because it was matte, black matte tiles, oh. which fascinated oh, me yes, as a sure. five-year-old, you know, and I would just draw with a wet finger That's and the, like... my grandmother would come in and tell me to stop dipping my finger in the toilet and drawing on the floor. And that was the kind of highfalutin stuff we shared, me and Herr Steinmeier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how did he like the house? He loved it. They were both really very impressed and very dazzled, which was very sweet. I mean, they really made quite an effort to come out and see it. They were in Boston for some other events having to do with the German-American Year of Friendship or something and made the effort to drive all the way out to Lincoln to see the house on a tight schedule and then go right back. So they were, he was genuinely very interested. At some point... You must have considered design and architecture for yourself, but you went into music. <laughs> you would think, with all of this in my background, you would think that some little dribbles of talent would have found their way down <laughs> the genetic tree. <laughs> but there's a dark streak of music tucked in there as well. And alas, that's what came out. And it all skipped me. Both of my sons are talented artists, and I really struggle with a stick figure. And both my parents would try to teach me privately, and then even my father said at one point gently, I guess this is not your thing. <laughs> uh -huh. Are there musicians in your past, in your ancestors? There are musicians in my past, and my grandmother's mother sang in the opera at the Kaiser's court. Ooh. I don't believe she was a prima donna, but she was more than just in the chorus. So there's a little thread, and you know, in, in those days, I mean, that was considered part of a good upper-class education, right? I mean, you just took an instrument, you learned how to sing, you yep. learned how to write poetry. So, yes, they all sang, and 
even composed a little bit. So it's it's in there somewhere, and uh, alas, it expressed itself in me to the detriment of any other visual gifts. So I have to ask you, are there any good architecture songs? Because I haven't found <laughs> any except perhaps there was a Simon and Garfunkel hit called So Long, Frank Lloyd Wright, which was on their Bridge Over Troubled Water album. Yes, and I think, right. he, I think he used the word hit loosely there. Yeah. <laughs> it was a hit album. <laughs> right. But it's a great the song. The only other one, of course, which was banned from my grandmother's house. My grandfather was gone at that point, but it's Tom Lehrer's great song about Alma Mahler Gropius Werfel. Do you know that no. one? No. Oh. Tell us oh, more. Oh, my goodness. Gentlemen, you've got to go look that up. Yeah. It's a riot, but of course, it's, you know, it's a crudely drawn, but not entirely inaccurate <laughs> uh, depiction of Alma, my sort of step grandmother, if you will, who um, married Gustav Mahler and then married Walter Gropius and then had a long affair with Oskar Kokoschka and then finally married Franz Werfel. So she hit German music, German architecture, German art, and German literature. Well, Erica, we have a very wonderful surprise for you. Although the song she referenced by Tom Lehrer, Alma, was popular way back in 1965, Tom himself is still very much around and gave us permission to play it. <laughs> Walter Gropius' first wife, Alma, was the early 20th century version of Cardi B, out there, fully self-expressed and unapologetic as you could be at that time. If you want to find the New York Times obituary Tom references in the song's introduction, just type Alma Mahler Werfel Obituary into Google. <laughs> with much, much appreciation, here's Tom Lehrer with Alma. Last December 13th, there appeared in the newspapers... The juiciest, spiciest, raciest obituary it has ever been my pleasure to read. <laughs> it was that of a lady named Alma Mahler Gropius Werfel, who had in her lifetime managed to acquire as lovers practically all of the top creative men in Central Europe. And among these lovers, who were listed in the obituary, by the way, which is what made it so interesting, <laughs> there were three whom she went so far as to marry. One of the leading composers of the day, Gustav Mahler, composer of Das Lied von der Erde and other light classics. Uh, one of the leading architects, Walter Gropius, of the Bauhaus School of Design, and one of the leading writers, Franz Werfel, author of The Song of Bernadette and other masterpieces. It's, it's people like that who make you realize how little you've accomplished. It is a sobering thought, for example, that when Mozart was my age, he had been dead for two years. <laughs> it seemed to me on reading this obituary that the story of Alma was the stuff of which ballads should be made, so here is one. The loveliest girl in Vienna was Alma the smartest as well Once you picked her up on your antenna You'd never be free of her spell Her lovers were many and varied From the day she began her begin There were three famous ones whom she married And God knows how many between Alma, tell us All modern women are jealous which of your magical wands got you Gustav and Walter and Franz? The first one she married was Mahler, whose buddies all knew him as Gustav. And each time he saw her, he'd holler, Ach, that is the Fräulein I must have. Their marriage, however, was murder. He'd scream to the heavens above, I'm writing Das Lied von der Erde. And she only wants to make love Alma, tell us All modern women are jealous You should have a statue in bronze For bagging Gustav and Walter and Franz While married to Gus, she met Gropius And soon she was swinging with Walter Gus died and her teardrops were copious she cried all the way to the altar But he would work late at the Bauhaus 
and only came home now and then. She said, what am I running? A chow house? It's time to change partners again. Alma, tell us, all modern women are jealous. Though you didn't even use ponds, you got Gustav and Walter and Franz. While married to Walt, she'd met Verfeld, and he too was caught in her net. He married her, but he was careful, cause Alma was no Bernadette. And that is the story of Alma, who knew how to receive and to give. The body that reached her embalma was one that had known how to live. Alma, tell us, how can they help being jealous? Ducks always envy the swans who get Gustav and Walter. You never did falter with Gustav and Walter and Franz. That was Tom Lehrer singing Alma, a very special and apparently forbidden song in Walter Gropius's household. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure and hearing these stories. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you both, and thank you for your interest, and thank you for your podcast. I mean, I think it's wonderful. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnus Radio is underwritten by... Angela Roll, your special real estate agent for modernist houses. Okay, Tom, take us home. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 8,000 significant modernist houses, and access 3 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Carrie Cesarino researches guests while juggling two above-average children, a flaming sword, a bowling ball, and a bottle of Dom Perignon. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I'll be back soon with another edition of U.S. Modernist Radio.